So, uh, well, yes, Tommy say, my name is Mariana Janes Atita, and I'm currently working in AstraZeneca as an associate principal scientist in the advanced drug delivery department in pharmaceutical sciences. And I did my PhD with Tommy, did a lot of neutrons, put him to wash a lot of troughs. So mm -hmm. I can recommend that you do that with your supervisors, but I did make sure that he got a nice dinner afterwards. <laughs> Uh, today I'm going to talk about lipid nanoparticles for mRNA delivery. Uh, let's see. Okay, so thank you very much, Tommy, for inviting me to this presentation. And I want to kind of summarize a bit what I would like you to learn from this presentation. So I want to have a. I want to start with a kind of high overview of what mRNA therapeutics are, uh, especially kind of promising challenges and advances. Um, then I'm going to talk a bit how to make the lipid nanoparticles for RNA delivery, and then importantly how to characterize uh, and the performance of these LMPs. And then, of course, this is a neutron core, so we're going to talk about how to use neutrons, especially small angle neutron scattering for the LMP development. And then I'm going to present two different cases looking at, uh, with, use, with the use of SANS, uh, the effect of protein binding on the LMP structure, and also how to use uh, SANS to functionalize the lipid nanoparticles or characterize functionalized lipid nanoparticles for subcutaneous administration. And I mean, if you want to interrupt me, I don't know how you do that with the other presentations, just please go ahead and just uh, unmute yourself and ask questions, it's fine for me. Uh, so I'm going to start with the mRNA therapeutics, promises, challenges, and advances. So I guess that all of you are aware that mRNA therapeutics are a thing. They're very uh, popular at the moment. So the promises is that we can produce proteins in vivo by administrating mRNA. And this is typically the approach that we want to achieve when administrating the protein uh, itself is not viable because the proteins degrade, because the proteins don't reach the target, because the proteins will not have the right, right function. So then we would prefer to administer the mRNA to produce the proteins in vivo. However, I'm a physchem, and when I look at mRNA, mRNA is a very long charge, negatively charged polyelectrolyte. So that means that it's not very easy to deliver mRNA because it needs to cross an equally negatively charged cell membrane to enter the cytoplasm and actually produce this protein. Uh, and you can imagine that that's not an easy task for a negatively charged polyelectrolyte. Additionally, our body is made to destroy foreign mRNA. So then we need to protect from enzymatic degradation before it reaches the target cell. And another very challenge, very big challenge for mRNA therapeutics is actually finding a biocompatible vehicle. Uh, and typically when the mRNA enters the, the, the cells, so it crosses uh, the cell membrane through different mechanisms dependent on the delivery, uh, enters the cytoplasm, it's read by the ribosomes and the, the, this is producing the kind of polypeptide that will become part of the protein. Uh, so when people talk about the mRNA vaccines, this is not something that was developed in a year. This is something that has 50, 60 years of development. So first of all, the discovery of mRNA was done in the early 60s. And from then we have come a long way. So from the discovery of mRNA, we have come a long way to understand how can we translate both in vitro, how, how we can develop uh, delivery systems. The first were liposomes. Uh, maybe some of you are familiar with lipofectamine. It's typically used in a lot of cell assays to um, uh, trans or to yeah, deliver the, the, the mRNAs commercially for um, in vitro assays, but it's not uh, very friendly for uh, humans. Uh, it has been uh, tested both in vitro and typically in animal models. Um, already in the early 90s, there were developments uh, of an influenza vaccine using uh, liposomes uh, uh, that contain mRNA. It's also commonly used for cancer immunotherapy. Uh, there's also other uh, applications such as uh, cardiovascular diseases. Um, uh, already companies like Moderna were reporting in 2017 uh, clinical trials using mRNA vaccines against the Zika virus. Uh, and all of those advances allow us to have the first two mRNA vaccines that received emergency authorization against COVID last year. So I think it's pretty exciting to see this uh, actually become a reality. Uh, but then I'm gonna talk about the lipid nanoparticles for RNA delivery because we have come a long way with mRNA, but we need to understand how to deliver the mRNA. 
And when we talk about lipid nanoparticles for mRNA, we typically talk about this specific technology. We talk about a um, lipid formulation that has mainly a cationic ionizable lipid. In this case, uh, the lipid that I'm going to talk is called DLIN MC3 DMA. It's uh, quite used in literature, but it's also a product for siRNA. And these kind of lipids have a, a head group that is amine based typically, and it has uh, what we call an apparent pKa. That means that the pKa is measured inside the LMP. And that apparent pKa is somewhere between six and seven. That means that a physiological pH around 7.4, the LMPs are, or, or the cationic lipids are typically on charge. Uh, but when the pH decreases, because this is typically the mechanism when it enters the cells in the endosomes, the uh, cationic lipid becomes charged. This positive charge will allow it to interact with the endosomal membrane and disrupt the endosomal membrane and deliver the mRNA inside the cell. So this is, this is an important feature because uh, when you have a constantly charged lipid, this typically alerts the body that there is a foreign system. So it's good to have an uncharged system before it enters the cell, but then you need to have this charge to actually be able to deliver the mRNA into the cell. Uh, additionally, we have typically helper lipids. Those helper lipids are typically sterol or cholesterol, um, a phospholipid like a DSPC. And then we have a polyethylene glycolipid that's helped to stabilize, uh, sterically stabilize the LMP structure. Uh, so as I mentioned, the cationic ionizable lipid helps to encapsulate uh, as well the mRNA because it forms some kind of complex, a cationic uh, lipid with the negatively charged nucleotides of the mRNA. It protects it until it reaches the target cell, and it also helps to uh, uh, release it inside the cell by disrupting the endosomal membrane. LMPs were originally developed for siRNA. Uh, and this small, already in 2010, there were reports in the literature about LMPs. Uh, and there has been a lot of uh, attempts to understand how the LMP structure looks like, but also to be able to uh, understand if we can improve its performance. And this was a representation of, from molecular dynamic simulations on how it will look with an siRNA. Uh, how do we prepare LMPs? There's different approach to prepare LMPs, but the most commonly reported literature is the use of microfluidics. So what we have is typically the lipids, uh, which are not water soluble, we have them in an ethanol phase. And the mRNA, which is not ethanol soluble, we have in an aqueous phase, which is typically a low pH. And we mix this in a microfluidic uh, chamber. And uh, what happens is when we have the mixture, in this case, this is a specific system called a nano assembler, which is from a company called Precision Nano Systems. They have what they call inside a mixed uh, herringbone structure that make, helps to create this kind of um, flow or chaotic flow to help preparing the samples and also to um, helps to make them a bit smaller and, and consistently the same size. Uh, so that's why we like to prepare the LMPs in the microfluidic mixer because we typically get very reproducible results with a very high encapsulation, more than 90%. After we get the LMPs, we, uh, since I said originally we have them in ethanol the lipids and in uh, acidic buffer the mRNA, we typically dialyze them uh, against a physiological pH buffer. And if we need them, we concentrate them. Uh, and then we do some particle characterization. Uh, that's the most standard size and encapsulation. Um, this is a little uh, like spreadsheet or how we look when you're calculating uh, your. Um, amounts for your um, preparation of the LMPs. So we actually make, typically mix them in a one to three ratio. That means that for each part of the ethanol volume, we have three parts of the mRNA volume. Uh, we, in this case, we have a lipid concentration of maximum typical 12.5 millimolar. And the reason is because when you try to do more and more concentrations, you have a more risk that this will get uh, stuck inside the microfluidic chip. So you don't want to make it too concentrated either. And um, another important thing is uh, the N to P ratio. The N to P ratio N starts for the, stands for the um, N or, cat, or amine groups in the cationic lipid. And P stars, stands from the phosphorus uh, of the nucleotide. 
So it's basically a positive to negative charge ratio. Uh, but in this case, the n is not the negative, it's the positive. Uh, so when you say uh, three, means that you have three cationic lipids per nucleotide. Uh, this is very important for the particle formation. So uh, if you start going to lower n to p ratio to one to one, then this can typically uh, precipitate and not form stable particles. You typically want to have them slightly overcharged when you made them. So more cationic lipid than uh, uh, nucleotides in the solution. Uh, another important is to have uh, the composition of your LMPs. This is the most standard composition that we have is 50% of the cationic lipid, around 10% of the phospholipid, 38.5% of uh, mole percent of the cholesterol, and 1.5% of the peg. Uh, and this is basically, I mean, I actually have the Excel sheet that I can uh, share with you later, but this is what we use uh, to calculate our preparation. So we put input our volume. Another important is to have the, if you have the charge density of your uh, mRNA or DNA or, or whatever you're, you're using to input it here. Uh, so you can have the right um, uh, calculations on the weight and, and the solution. Uh, so as I mentioned, we, we use a, a system in our lab, which is a, called a nanosampler. Uh, and the nanosampler is typically what we call a bench top. So it's not necessarily what it will be called, what we would use in a large scale uh, to produce the vaccine, but it's a representative of what we can do in our lab. Make, can make LMPs around one milliliter to 50 milliliter. Uh, then we typically take them out. We dialyze in PDS in some uh, dialysis cassettes and we can concentrate them using uh, Amicon uh, ultra centrifugation filters. Uh, Sorry, uh, uh, Mariana. Yeah. Uh, if I may ask a question here. Yes. Yeah, so um, I was wondering about uh, like what are usually the sizes of this uh, lipid nanoparticles? So I will come into that, but for this preparation that I show you, it's yeah. somewhere around, I will say, if you measure by DLS, the intensity average distribution will be somewhere between 70 to 80 nanometers. Ah, okay. And I was also wondering about the structure. So do you have this uh, bilayer structure that en encapsulates your M mRNA or it's just a sort of a micellar structure, which, uh, because in, in, in the chip that you showed, you had this ethanol uh, where lipids are dissolved and you have mRNA and then they mix together and form the nanoparticles. So I was wondering, like looking at the cartoon, what the kind of structure it is. So I'll show you a cryotm, but it's, it's, I can say that it's not a micelle oh. uh, in, the, in my definition of micelle and it's not a liposome either. Oh, okay. uh, <laughs> so it's somewhere in between. So it's not, uh, it's not just a simple bilayer that is filled with water where the mRNA is. It's a more complex system. Okay. So, so, but I, I will show you cryotm because it's always nice when you can actually see them. Um, yeah. And of course, neutrons will help us to know much better how they look. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I will go, that was a very good question because now we'll go to the characterization and performance of the LMPs. Uh, so when, when we talk about physical chemical characterization of the LMPs, what do we specifically we talk? So I kind of, we divide them here in waves and the waves depends on the complexity because we were not going to do the same characterization for all of the uh, preparations that we do. I mean, we make LMPs fairly often, so we, we cannot do <laughs> the most complex um, techniques for all the preparations. So typically when we have our preparation, uh, the first thing that we measure is the size and for that we use dynamic line scattering, a uh, simple kind of instrument in the lab, a Malvern system. And then we measure the encapsulation with a fluorescence assay called ribogreen. Ribogreen is a dye that binds to mRNA. So we typically measure what happens uh, if we add the dye and then we kind of solubilize the LMP with uh, surfactants such as triton and measure again what happens uh, with the concentration of mRNA to see how much is free, how much is total, and then we measure the encapsul encapsulation efficiency. These are what we, I call the wave one characterization. Wave two is to look at more complex uh, characteristics of the LMPs. There are all the fluorescent acids called TNS. TNS is also a dye that allows us to measure what we call the apparent PK of the LMPs. Uh, so typically when people report in the literature, the PK of the cationic lipids, they always report them as, I mean, cationic lipids are not soluble in water. They always report them in uh, some kind of lipid nanoparticle. So it will always be influenced by the composition of your LMP. We can also measure the zeta potential that can be important, but measuring zeta potential of the LMP is challenging. 
you have to, um, especially sometimes when, if we are used to working in systems like the Malvern Cetacizer, it's very easy to get a result, but we need to understand if that result is actually physically meaning. So to measure the uh, Cetacizer potential of the LMPs, we had to uh, try to have a low ionic strain and low concentration. So it takes a bit of tweaking to actually get good measurements of the Cetacizer potential of the LMPs. That's why we don't do them as a standard control. Uh, we could also look at NMR. NMR can give also in, uh, information about charge. It can also give information about the structure. It's a bit complex to analyze, but it's possible. We also have a lot of NMR instruments here in AstraZeneca. Then what I call the wave through is the instruments that we actually don't have in-house, and we typically had to go to the university or we had to go to large-scale facilities. One of them is the cryo-TM. So this is a small picture of the cryo-TM, how the LMPs look, and I will have more pictures afterwards. So as I mentioned, that most of the particles are here and this in this kind of small circle, <laughs> and they are not liposome likes. They are actually uh, electron dense, so they are. Uh, you can see that they are uh, all the way through. They're like dark gray. I will have a better picture afterwards. Uh, we can also do both small angle X-ray uh, scattering uh, and then a neutral scattering as well to look at both uh, the structure and the lipid distribution. And I will come more to a specific sample. Of, of how they look and how, what does the structure means. So this is a better picture uh, of how the LMPs look by cryo-TEM. Uh, and typically the standard approach when we started to work this, uh, so I did my postdoc here in AstraZeneca with uh, lipid nanoparticles. And when we started looking at the lipid nanoparticles, we took the example, as I said, from the siRNA, where they report in the literature is that they would have 50% of the cationic lipid 10% of the DSPC, and then they will add more PEG if they wanted to reduce the LMP size, and they compensate this with the cholesterol. That means that you typically have as a base 40% cholesterol, and then if you add 1% PEG lipid, then you will add only 39% uh, mole percent cholesterol. And as you can say, as the, see as the uh, PEG lipid percentage uh, decreases, the particle size increases. And, and you can also see that sometimes when they're a bit bigger, you can find some liposomes, but in, in the majority of the population are basically uh, these kind of dark spheres that are uh, all uh, dense in the core. Um, and then you, when you're, they're small, you can also start seeing maybe a smaller that are a bit more regular. We can also compare the size uh, from the DLS number distribution with the size from the cryotian distribution and find a very good correlation. Uh, these are three typical preparations. So the, a lot of the sizes are going to come back around the presentation. So we have some around 40. This is number size, number size distribution, 60 and 90. So the number size is typically slightly smaller than the um, intensity average distribution. So when we started to look at this, this LMP, so we started looking at four different sizes between 40 nanometers and 140 nanometers. Um, then we uh, started doing in vitro assays uh, and we picked two um, clinically relevant cells. One is human adipocytes. So adipocytes are fat cells that are just under our skin. Uh, so when we have uh, administration, subcutaneous administration, those are the first cells that typically the LMPs are gonna encounter. Um, and then another one, so we took our uh, induced pluripotent stem cell derived hepatocytes, which are liver cells and are also very relevant because if we have an IV administration of LMPs, these LMPs typically will end in the liver. Uh, we label in this case the, the LMPs with DSPC that had tritium in it to be able to, to track uh, how much was inside the cells. And what we found was that the uptake was uh, more or less the same independently of the size. We didn't really see a trend on the pen, uh, if, if it was smaller or bigger, maybe for the adipocytes, the 60 nanometers was a bit more, but definitely for the hepato hepatocytes, there was not a big difference. Um, but the interesting was not the uptake. The interesting was actually what happens when they're inside the cell. And what we can see is actually, we measure here a protein called eripoprotein. Uh, and this protein, uh, so when we administer the mRNA, this protein will be produced inside the cells and it will, it's actually a secreted protein. So we can measure it from the supernatal of the in vitro experiments. And what we can see is that the 60 nanometer uh, LMPs had a significant higher protein expression in both cell types compared to either smaller or larger LMPs. And we couldn't understand. Why are these LMPs uh, 
better than the other ones. I mean, what makes it 60 nanometer? Because the uptake, they all look to be up to, taking up uh, the, more or less the same amount. So. Uh, and then uh, I, I came, that was when I was fresh back from my PhD. And I said, oh, why don't we do a neutron experiment? And I drafted a neutron proposal as I was very well coached by Richard. I think, I don't know if you had had that ex exercise already or you will have how to write a beam time proposal, but I think it's, it's a really good thing I learned from, from my PhD supervisors. Um, and I mean, I guess that, I mean, I could probably skip this slide because you have had a much better introductions to, to uh, small angle scattering at the moment, but we, what we were interested was if we could understand a bit more about the structure of the LMPs and if this could guide us to why 60 nanometer LMPs were better than um, smaller or bigger. Uh, and especially, I was interested in not only use uh, small angle X-ray scattering, but to use a uh, neutron scattering, because as you have probably seen already in the course, it's good to be the last day, uh, we could do selected iteration of either the lipid components or the solvent to produce different scattering profiles. Uh, and we have significant, we have many components. We have uh, the cationic lipid, we have the phospholipid, we have the cholesterol, we have the peg lipid plus the mRNA. So we needed to figure out actually what can we uh, do trade to be able to highlight. So if we have, for example, the um, DSPC, uh, hydrogenous DSPC, the tails are have very close matching point to the to just pure water, and the head groups are very close to deuterated cholesterol. But if we have deuterated the DSPC, then the scattering density is much higher. So we could really highlight the DSPC. Iron 8 also has a, a scattering and density that will change depending on the content of D2O because it has labile uh, hydrogens that can be in exchanged. So typically the match point uh, is around, I don't remember right now, four uh, uh, scattering and density. So, so we, we kind of match, the first thing that we did was, okay, these are all components. We calculated their scattering and density. We see which molecules are available to deuterate and we can start playing on how to design this LMP to be able to highlight certain parts, both from the deuteration of the lipids, but also the deuteration of the salt. But you can imagine that the first thing that we did was not sans because we needed to have data before. So we actually did some uh, SACs. Uh, an interesting what we can see is that um, when we have mRNA inside the LMPs, we can see one peak at approximately one inverse nanometer that corresponds to a correlation distance of around six nanometers. But this is only in the presence of mRNA. We couldn't see it in the absence of mRNA. And we could see the same peak independently of the size in the same position. It was a different uh, intensity or a different order, but it was exactly the same peak. But I mean, I guess that you have now a background in scattering, so you will know that with one peak, difficult to fit uh, a thing. So it could be anything. It could be in the literature has been reported. This is potential an inverted micellar phase. So this could be maybe a correlation distance between these micelles. Some people says that maybe this looks like an onion, so a multilamellar vesicle. Uh, could it be the mRNA, some kind of worm-like micelles, and these are kind of correlation distance between these worm-like micelles? We didn't know. So then we, we went, and, and why do we care about the structure of the LMPs? I mean, why was it important? I mean, what is reported in the literature is that LMP transfection efficacy is very low. It's typically single digit, less than 10%. That means that if you administer a vaccine that has, I don't know, 100 micrograms of mRNA, perhaps less than 10 micrograms are the ones that are making their, the, the job. So it's, it's a very small amount, and a lot of it is just being recycled. Um, and we want to understand if we can modify, I mean, the structure of the LMP to facilitate this endosomal escape. And this is not something that is new. I mean, a lot of companies, a company that is based in Luz, Camurus, has been doing this for many, many years, trying to understand uh, how the uh, kind of liquid crystalline structure can facilitate both encapsulation and the delivery of small molecules and larger molecules. Uh, so, yeah, so I, as I said, I drafted my nice uh, SANS proposal. I got some beam time in, in Garching in Munich uh, and we went there and I didn't know what to expect. I just designed uh, a few kind of particles. Uh, one was deuterated DSPC and partially deuterated cholesterol that it can be fine, uh, found in Avanti, uh, so commercially. Uh, and we look at different kind of uh, D2O, H2O ratios. And what we found actually was something very interesting we found that one of the lipids, the DSPC, was mainly segregated at the surface. So we were actually able to fit five different profiles to a core shell model, 
where basically we can ha summarize it as we had an LMP core and then a monolayer, which was mainly enriched by the DSPC. And then we had on top a PEG layer with solvent in, and the PEG was in a mushroom conformation. Uh, and this was very exciting because what it was in the literature was not this. When we look at the first siRNA um, simulations, we it was believed that all of the lipids besides the PEG that it was still believed that be in the surface were distributed homogeneously across the LMP. So I think we were really the first ones to show uh, that the lipids were partially segregated in the LMP surface. You cannot see that from cryotm. You cannot see that from SACS. SACS was the only technique that allows us to actually see where the lipids were located. With the first experiments that we did, we had very limited information about the distribution because, as I said, we only have a few components that we could we had deuterated. So the DSPC is commercially available, and the partially deuterated cholesterol is commercially available. Uh, the other components, cholesterol, is is you can find a higher level, but it uh, has to be in a deterioration facility, and the cationic lipid was definitely not commercially available. We could still get an estimation that we have uh, around 20% water, 24% water inside the core. So it was mainly lipids. Uh, but finally, we'd actually, uh, we had continued this work and now we're collaborating uh, with the colleagues in Malmö University with Marite Cardenas, which is also a former boss of Tommy and uh, Federica Sebastiani, who is also a former boss of Richard. Um, and then we could actually see what was the lipid distribution by not only having due deuterated the SPC, but uh, our colleagues here in AstraZeneca could synthesize uh, deuterated uh, cationic lipid, in this case MC3, and uh, our colleagues in different uh, deuteration facilities, uh, I think this was provided by ANSTO, the Australian source, could provide what they call match out cholesterol, so it has a much higher uh, scattering density, and we could actually pinpoint that all the SPCs at the surface, the cholesterol is distributed both the surface and the core, but it's mainly at the surface of the LMP in the same layer as the DSPC. The MC3 is both at the surface and at the core, but it's actually mainly at the core of the LMP, so it's depleted from the surface. The PEG lipid we already knew that was at the surface and the mRNA is at the core. So we can actually put a number on how much there is at the surface and at the core of each of the components. Uh, yeah. Yeah, in the, the last graph, like, like you were talking about, like, so I just missed, like, how did you do this analysis? Like, how do you differentiate between, like, how much, like, quantify how much of this is in this part and in the core or in the shell? Like, yeah, so I, I don't have the, the, the data. I didn't put it in this presentation. I should have. Uh, but we did a lot of uh, mixtures. So we started to prepare samples where we have uh, only deuterated cholesterol, match out cholesterol, only deuterated cationic lipid. We started to mix, we have two of the cationic, uh, you know, cationic lipid and the cholesterol. Are so we did prepare many different particles and start looking at the uh, scattering at many different uh, H2O, D2O buffer ratios and try to find what was the matching point. So we got uh, equivalent to what we did in the first experiment, but we got much more data that we could fit consistently to actually put numbers to the, to the, to the volume fraction of each component at the surface and at the core. Uh, so it was similar to, to this experiment. Actually, it's, um, I didn't put the data, but it should be in a publication that came just uh, early this year, all of the preparation. So it was quite a lot of beam times to collect all that data. Okay, thank you very much. I will also, is it this article you mentioned down in the corner? Yeah, this one here. So this one has all the preparations. I mean, Sebastian, uh, Federica and I will, we, Federica did the experiments and, and plan a bit the mixtures. I prepared the LMP, so we, we did uh, around, I don't know, maybe six, eight preparations to get all of this <laughs> composition. So it, it was very many different um, contrasts that we tried. Okay, thank you very much. So um, so now that we knew actually how the lipids were distributed, both in the core and at, this, at the surface of the LMPs, we really wanted to understand a bit more about the core. So as I said, we saw from SACS one peak, but that one peak tells you nothing. Uh, so what we did, we, was, we tried to do what we call a bulk phase. And what is a bulk phase? So we take, now we know that it's mainly cationic lipid and cholesterol in the core, no DSPC, no PEG. And we mix this with the mRNA in water, but this will not form particles. Uh, this will fall more of a continuous phase and it's not water soluble. 
Uh, but we try to understand if we can take this phase uh, and analyze it and have a further information on how it is uh, just the core, not the surface. First, we put the cationic lipid, cholesterol, and ethanol mixed with mRNA water in a dialysis cassette. We put it in a similar conditions as the LMPs will typically form, which is a, a acidic buffer, in this case, citrate, and ethanol in a 3 to 1 ratio, similar to what we do in this nano assembler instrument. Then, after we have dialyzed this for like a day, we take this out and we put it against PBS because we also want to know how the, uh, it looks in a physiological pH because this is how the LMPs are typically stored. Uh, and this was also really interesting. So I'm going to start for the, from the, how the pattern look of the, the sex data of the core phase and the acidic condition. So the citrate ethanol 3 to 1 phase. So this is the data. First, I want to point out two peaks, which are pretty large here. And those peaks are typically cholesterol monohydrates. And we know that these phases will actually have a, a bit of excess of cholesterol. This was done before we did the work with, with Federica. Uh, so we, we added a similar kind of uh, cationic lipid cholesterol ratio as it will be in the LMPs, but the cholesterol has a limited solubility in the cationic lipid. That might be one of the reasons why it's segregated towards the surface. But if we kind of don't look at the cholesterol crystal, we, we know that they're there and we know that they're in excess of cholesterol. What we can see is that interesting, um, the, what we can see is a main peak around the in one inverse nanometer, so similar to the LMPs. But we can see additional peaks. And these additional peaks, so th if we call this the Q0, we have a Q1 and Q2, they come at a square root of three and a square root of four multiples of the original peak. And this is typically an indication of a reverse hexagonal phase. And then what we believe is that at low pH, the mRNA is uh, organized in some kind of water cylinder. So mRNA is a very long molecule. Um, and these water cylinders are uh, have a kind of hexagonal packing. And the, this inverse nano, one inverse nanometer or six uh, nanometers is the center to center distance between these uh, uh, water channels in a hexagonal packing. Uh, we also did some freeze fracture micrographs of the face and we could also see this, what we can believe are the water channels and we could measure the distance between the water channels to be approximately six nanometers as well. Uh, it was interesting what happened when we actually look at the bulk phase in the PBS storage buffer. So it's the, similar to what we have mentioned with the LMP uh, itself. So what we can see again is that uh, when we have no mRNA, we stop seeing that peak. That we don't have any more that, that, that uh, we, we have a bump, but we don't have any more that very highly ordered peak. Uh, neither the further peaks. We can only see the cholesterol uh, kind of crystal. Uh, but when we have, in this case, we don't use mRNA, and it's just because mRNA is extremely expensive. So we use a, a model molecule, so poly A. And we can see from the poly A is that we can still see the, the main peak uh, that we saw before at one inverse nanometer, although we cannot see anymore uh, with the same intensity the, the, the Q1 and Q2 is their god. So, so we believe that it's, this is a less order phase, but somehow related to the first hexagonal phase that we saw. When we look at the freeze fracture of the uh, kind of uh, upper phase, so the LMP similar with the poly A in PBS, we don't see any more these nice water channels. We see more of a kind of mixed structure. So what we believe is we originally, I think, call them in the in the publication a disorder hexagonal phase, but that, that sounds very uh, on. <laughs> Oh, no, doesn't sound very straightforward. I mean, it's an hexagonal phase, but it's disorder. What does that really mean? <laughs> so then we, we started calling it afterwards a worm-like mice. So it still is these water channels where the um, poly, poly A or mRNA is located, uh, but they're not any more structured in the typical hexagonal packing, but there's still some kind of correlation distance because it's a highly packed system of approximately six nanometers. And interesting, if we look at the empty LMPs as we saw before and at the, at the LMPs with the mRNA, we can see quite a lot of similarities between the bulk phase uh, and the LMP or dispersed phase. So I think we're still trying to understand and model this, this, uh, this peak. Um, so uh, my postdoc advisor here in AstraZeneca, Lena Linford, he has been working quite hard into try to have a proper model to quantify, quantify this uh, 
uh, a structure to get more information perhaps about solvent uh, is not straightforward it's uh, something that is uh, still ongoing and if you have any ideas i'm pretty sure that lena will be very happy to hear them uh, but then i said at the beginning that i was going to say i was going to talk about how the lmp uh, structure could help us to improve improve actually the development because we actually care about the performance it's very nice to understand the structure but if we want this to be a product if we want this to actually help patients we need to uh, be able to develop better lmps so what we found from our kind of neutron scattering experiments was that the original formulation approach that I mentioned, where we will add more PEG and reduce the amount of cholesterol, is this one in, in blue, actually was making not only the size change, but also the surface of the LMP change. So when we were ha having larger and larger and larger LMPs, we were having more and more DSPC on this, at the surface compared to the other components. And that means that the surface area per DSPC was decreasing. That means that the the uh, the almost 140 nanometer LMPs were had a similar surface area of, of a DSPC in a gel phase bilayer, so it, it feels that it was mainly just DSPC and not none of the other components. Uh, then we started to tweak, so we wanted to have different size of LMPs, but that will always have the same surface as of our best performing LMPs, which was this around 60 nanometer LMPs. So then we we said okay we we change the the we keep the cationic lipid cholesterol ratio constant and we change the other components we change the size and we keep the same surface as as the best LMP. And if you remember uh, the the kind of protein expression experiments that we did with the adipocytes, the fat cells. Uh, so the the original formulation had the best performance around the 62 nanometer LMPs. But when we changed the, the size and the surface of the LMPs, then we started to see that actually protein production was increasing when the LMP size was increasing. Because also ha bigger LMPs had more copies of mRNA in them, but originally when the surface was just the SPC, uh, there was not enough cationic lipid perhaps to disrupt the endosomal membrane and help this to be released into the cell cytoplasm but it had to be actually um, improve the surface to be able to, to deliver the package, let's say. So then we see it's not only size that matters for LMPs, but also the surface of the LMPs that matters. Now I'm gonna talk about uh, two uh, cases. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, I can take now about just the LMP structure. Otherwise I just talk about two examples and I'll leave some time as well for questions at the end. I have a question uh, about the LMP structure. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, my camera is not working. <laughs> That's why I'm not uh, switching on the camera. <laughs> yeah. So I was um, wondering about like, have you looked into the structure of the CIL uh, phase? It means lipid that you are uh, like, you know, looking into your samples, like you're using in your preparation. Like so you're using, if, uh, if I remember correctly, you're using the uh, DSPC and then you are using cholesterol. Mm -hmm. uh, peg and this cat uh, cationic uh, cationic uh, lipid right yeah yeah so in the cationic lipid have you looked into the structure of the cationic lipid as a function of like you know water content how does it behave uh, in a sense so 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 this is uh i mean this is a lipid so it's fairly water insoluble but we can look at the phase behavior in, in water so it's um typically cationic lipids for lmps are designed more what we call a conical shape so they have a very small head group compared to the tails and the reason is because it's believed that this will help uh, to disrupt the endosomal membrane in a, a more efficient way ah, okay. so so what uh, when we look at the cationic lipid at different ph uh, just like a bulk phase similar to what we did with the cholesterol uh, you can mainly see depending on the category but it's, it's typically also an hexagonal phase because this kind of uh, let's call them conical shaped lipids typically form hexagonal dispersed liquid crystalline phases. So uh, uh, it will yeah. also be, of course, dependent on, on if it's charged or not. So it will depend on the pH. pH also. But in your um, model that, that you have, uh, like, you know, obtained from uh, the uh, Sachs and Sands experiment, Sands basically, where uh, the cationic lipids um, is inside the core, that is inside the DSPC. So here I was wondering, like, how does it see the pH uh, in this case, like the change in pH? Because it's shielded by the peg layer and the DSPC. 
this is this is not uh, this is a bulk phase. So there is no in this case there is no DSPC or PEG. So it's it's a you take just the, the lipids that are in the core and you make is is uh, it's almost like a precipitate. The white white precipitate that you take is not an lipid nanoparticle anymore. Oh, so we're okay. just trying to understand how the liquid uh, crystalline what was the kind of phase behavior of this mixture uh, without um, in without the particles. So without the DSPC without the PEG. Okay. Okay. I see that. Yeah. Thank but you. but it does. But it does. I mean, if you change the pH, like mm -hmm. when with the LMPs, it will still. I mean, the lipids are uh, distributed across, and there will be equilibrium of you know proteins in and out of the LMP. Uh, uh, so if you reduce the pH, it will induce a ch charge ch change inside the LMPs. So there is changes depending on the pH on the structure. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And I mean, with that, I will uh, let maybe in the future that you see that you follow Federica and uh, because we actually have some sans data of how the LMP looks at low, at low pH and it's completely different on how the LMP looks at high pH. Oh. But uh, st she's still fitting the data. So I'm going to talk about the effect of the, uh, some, if you have any more questions, I, I can also take them now before I move to the next sample. Nope. Okay, we can also take them at the end. So the first it was the project actually that Federica and I and Marite started to work together and my, uh, also my colleague Leonard, uh, effect of the protein binding on the LMP structure. And why do we care? And what is interesting is when once you administer nanomedicines, uh, especially through kind of intravenous administration, and this is common for all kind of uh, medicines that you administer intravenous or I mean, that is in the plasma, they will form what they call a protein corona. Uh, and it's believed that one of the main proteins in the corona of LMPs is a protein called apolipoprotein E, which is uh, typically responsible for fat transport in our body, which makes sense because I mean, lipid nanoparticles, lipid is typically fat. Um, in the hepatocytes, so these liver cells, there are a lot of uh, ApoE receptors. So that's why a lot of these particles end in the liver in the hepatocytes. And once uh, the LMPs are inside, the, they are taken in the in the hepatocytes via a mechanism called endocytosis. Um, then the, typically the endosome inside the pH decreases, the lip cationic lipid become charged, and it's believed that this is what helps the disruption of the endosomal membrane and release of the cargo. Um, so we wanted to understand what happens to the actually structure of the LMP when ApoE is in contact with it, since we know that APOE is one of the most important structures. Uh, I don't have all the data, and maybe it's because I want you to go and click to the article, <laughs> or maybe I can send you the article as well if you want. Uh, but we also did a lot of work to try to understand what happens when APOE binds to the LMP. And what we see is actually that the APOE, uh, the APOE leads to a, a change in the structure of the LMP. Uh, it has been, uh, found in different um, studies that uh, it seems that APOE selectively binds certain lipids. So it might be that the uh, LMP can, the APOE can selectively bind some of the APOE and potentially remove it. But what we can see definitely is following the binding of the APOE to the surface of the LMP, we can see that there is an enrichment of cholesterol to, in the surface. So this is the volume fraction in the core of the component, the volume fractions on the shell before and after APOE uh, uh, binding. And what we can see is that there is an increase of the cholesterol at the surface and is, there is a decrease of the cationic lipid at the surface and potentially an, an increase at the core. So it is, there is a redistribution. And why is this important? So as I said, we are trying to get as much of the cationic lipid to be at the surface because this will help disrupt the endosomal membrane. So if we are designing LMPs um, that have a certain composition, then we add the prot or we administer, the proteins will bind to it and they will completely change the structure of the LMPs. This will affect how the LMPs perform. So we cannot, we don't need to, we, we need to understand not only the structure of the LMPs in our formulation before we administer, but we need to understand what happens when they're inside the body. Because we might have the perfect LMP in theory, but this might be a very different how it is inside the body. Uh, then I'm gonna end with uh, the last example, which is about the fun functionalization of lipid nanoparticles for subcutaneous administration. So why is subcutaneous administration important for LMPs? It's because it's the most um, 
easy for patients to, to do in-house. Uh, I mean, IV is more complex. I mean, intramuscular is fairly, but patients, for example, that had uh, diabetes or kind of chronic diseases are very used to using uh, onto injectors. So subcutaneous so administration is a fairly um, um, convenient way for patients to self-administer. However, to do uh, th therapies with mRNA for uh, chronic administration, we know, and I mean, you might heard that LMPs can cause uh, some kind of inflammation or side effects. And it's it believed that, uh, that this inflammatory response will um, be um, actually detrimental to be able to administer uh, LMPs more frequently. So the idea was that if you could include an anti-inflammatory compound, typically it's an um, esteroid uh, prodrug, this could reduce the inflammatory response. But to be able to actually reduce the inflammatory response, the, the, this uh, prodrug had to be at the surface of the LMP to be able to allow to enzymatic cleavage before it can enter the cell. Uh, so a lot of the molecules were designed, and this was also done with some of my colleagues here, Alexander, who was also a box, boss of Tommy before. So, so we decided an anti-inflammatory compound that we could, um, uh, um, that it was deuterated, and we also look at how it looks using a small angle neutron scattering. And what we could find is actually find that the anti-inflammatory compound was luckily mainly on the shell. And that helped us actually to, to design an LMP that was, uh, had anti-inflammatory properties that we could administer uh, more than once uh, so, and keep the same mRNA protein without eliciting an immune response in the body. So this was really exciting. It was also published very recently. So if you want to uh, learn a bit more about the study details, there are, there's also this uh, presentation here. And, and I can also send papers if you're interested afterwards. Uh, I'm going to summarize and I'm going to leave some time, I guess, for questions. So uh, I hope I convinced you and I hope maybe you didn't need to be convinced because you have seen in the news that the LMPs are the leading de delivery vehicles for RNA therapy. Um, to understand how, how to improve LMPs, uh, we need to understand that their transfection efficacy is not only size, but surface composition dependent. And this will also translate to other nanomedicines. Uh, I hope this is the last day of the SANS course that I don't need to convince you that SANS is a powerful tool for characterization and development of mRNA containing lipid nanoparticles. Uh, also that uh, binding of proteins such as APOE can cause uh, changes on the lipid distribution. And that's what we also need to understand not only how the NMPs look in the formulation, but also how they looks in, the, in contact with the uh, um, plasma. Uh, and that we can actually design more complex NMPs. And, and for example, in this case, we were adding an anti-inflammatory compound to reduce immunogenicity, but it could also be a targeting ligand. Like, and, and, and that can also help us to improve the LMP performance if we want to go to a specific part of the cell or if we want to yeah, get a different response in the body. And we can also use SANS to, to help us characterize these NMPs. And with that, I think I am in okay time, Tommy. So if there is questions. Very good uh, timing, Mariana. So please um, ask questions. Mariana, I have one more question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> uh, maybe uh, you have mentioned this, I missed it in your presentation, but uh, one thing is a bit intriguing to me, like when we are using um, uh, this uh, lipid nanoparticles as drug delivery, so when you are administrating it, like under the, like, you know, under the skin or it's directly into the blood uh, stream. So... And and how does it reach the target sort of um, means like how means what do you, what, what what do you think how does it reach the target i guess it depends on on what's what's the kind of indication what are you trying to 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 treat i mean if it's a vaccine which is more of a kind of you know create an immune response so there is there is different ways of administrating lmps typically is um, iv or mm -hmm. intramuscular now for the vaccines i mean so you have systemic administration and you have also have local administration Okay. Uh, so if uh, local administration is more preferred when you know that to reach a target cell is more complex, let's say, uh, I think um, maybe I, I should go back to the first of the mRNA development. So, I mean, mRNA, although there is a, the most promising application is vaccines at the moment for mRNA, mRNA therapies are being um, 
developed for many different diseases because a lot, I mean, it's not easy to, uh, to uh, um, deliver proteins and diseases that are related, for example, in the brain, in the lung. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> So, so uh, for example, uh, I think there is uh, there is an example here from the '90s where they were looking at mRNA injection into the brain, and this is an animal model, of course, mm -hmm. for protein replacement. I mean, this is something that you would have to do, of course, uh, 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 locally because to do uh, to cross the brain blood barrier is very, very uh, difficult. <laughs> if you had to do this type of therapy, if you had to do it in the lung, then it might be easier to do inhale. Uh, LMPs, but then that will be a different way of challenge for both the kind of the development of the LMPs to be sure that the things do not get stuck in the <laughs> in the respiratory tract and and also that the LMPs are stable uh, in whatever formulation that you have because it might not be the same type of formulation if you're gonna do inhale, if you're gonna do subcutaneous, if you're gonna do an intravenous. So uh, typically, I don't think that an oral LMP will be a product because uh, that will be completely. Uh, destroyed by the gastric acid. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's what I was yeah, thinking also. Yeah. Um, can I ask one more question? Yeah, of yeah. course. So I was wondering, like, uh, if I, uh, uh, I have read, like, if you, if, you, if you induce any foreign particles, like, for example, then already your immune system starts marking it as a foreign particle, right? And then you have this... Um, I remember it reading in terms of uh, like, you know, when you are having this colloidal particles that are being put, like, you know, that are inserted, that you have this protein corona that, that by, like, you know, surrounds it. And it, it, it practically then it, it cages the particle inside and then marks it for degradation. So in this case, like, uh, means how does that, uh, this LMPs avoid that step of the immune system? They don't, I mean. Uh, uh, okay. So your your body will uh, start identifying LMP. So if 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 you have like uh, chronic or continuous administration of LMPs, your body will start. I mean, it depends, of course, of everybody's immune system, but they will mm -hmm. start identifying the different components of the LMPs, and they will start clearing them pretty fast. Your body is pretty smart, mm -hmm. uh, so so it doesn't avoid avoid uh, the the kind of like um, immune response. It does decrease it because compared to cationic permanently charged cationic nanoparticles mm -hmm. these are much easier to identify by the body than the the, the cationic and isolipid kind of hides a bit in the kind of plasma but there are there are antibodies that for the peg mm -hmm. uh, I think that's one of the most thing that it was hypothesized on why some of the vaccines had a potential side effects for some people like this uh, anaphylactic anaphylactic uh, shock that could be related to the peck okay. um so so i mean they can cause an immune response so we could mm. think for example the first srna therapy uh, that mm. was done for a product that is approved at the moment on patron and mm. this is done to basically knock down a protein production of a protein that is really uh uh, on favorable, it's, it's a protein that is misfolding and forming amyloids. Okay. Uh, but you need to administer that product with dexamethasone, uh, which is uh, yeah, kind of like anti-inflammatory uh, drug. Okay. Otherwise, your body will recognize it and will recycle it and stop the, 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 okay. the effect. Hmm. That's it. Yeah. Thank so, you. <clears throat> so, any more questions? I see, Trevor, you have unmuted yourself. So, you want to say something? Okay. I think Trevor knows this work because he was also working with Federica and myself. Oh, okay, okay, okay. But, uh, well, thank you, Tommy, for inviting me. Uh, if you have any questions, you can also reach out to me.